So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our Bucksbaum panel on the right to affordable health care. Uh, my name is Lori Nosbush. I'm um, a Bucksbaum student scholar and a fourth year medical student. Um, we're really looking forward to this event tonight. It's such an important topic and we have really a great panel here tonight. I want to thank you guys so much for coming out. I know you're busy, so we really appreciate that you're here to speak with us. I think we're going to have a really great discussion. Um, before we start, I just wanted to take a second to kind of outline how we'd like the night to go. Um, I'm going to introduce each speaker like one by one, and after I introduce that one speaker, um, he'll have like five, seven minutes-ish just to kind of talk through his um, thoughts on um, the right to affordable health care. And then we'll, um, I'll introduce the next speaker, and they'll have their five to seven minutes, and we'll just go through each speaker. After each speaker, or after all the speakers have had um, their chance to kind of give their initial thoughts, um, we'll give them an opportunity to respond to each other and um, to thoughts that they have on what the other speakers have said. And then once we kind of, if we have a natural break after that, we can move into some Q&A um, with some audience participation, hopefully. We're really looking forward to that. So with that, I think we can go ahead and get started, unless anyone has any questions right off the bat. All right, well, we'll just start on the far end. Um, this is Dr. Viroff. He will be speaking pro right to affordable health care. Um, he is Dr. Viroff, MD, PhD. He's an assistant professor of medicine and an intensivist in the adult and pediatric ICUs here at UFC. He's a national board advisor to Physicians for a National Health Program and president of the Illinois Single Payer Coalition. He has additionally previously served as president of the Northern Illinois branch of Physicians for a National Health Program and also serves as faculty advisor to um, our Pritzker's PNHP student group. His current research is in the immunology of sepsis in the ICU. He completed graduate training in pharmacology and his medical training at Case Western, followed by residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at UCLA. And then he completed subspecialty ICU fellowship training at the University of Chicago. We'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, thanks. Um, so as uh, probably as implicitly clear, or explicitly clear, I'm an outspoken advocate for single-payer health care reform, um, and specifically for the creation of a government-run uh, national health insurance system that would be for everybody, and it would be comprehensive. So it would include um, inpatient and outpatient care, mental health care, emergency care, long-term care, um, and there wouldn't be co-pays, co-insurance deductibles. And I know we're not here to debate the delivery mechanism, so I'm not going to say a whole lot more about that per se, but I want to just make it clear that that's sort of my position from the outset. And so, of course, it goes without saying that I believe that, um, that there is a human right to health care. Now, the question is, is there a human right to affordable health care? And I think that's kind of a, a silly question, because what good is health care if it's not affordable? You know, and I think that the that the example of hepatitis C is a really, you know, good one right now, is that if you're an uninsured, um, you don't have access to what is effectively a cure for a terrible disease. And that means that there is now a cost, both uh, borne by society in terms of you not being a productive member of society, as well as, you know, the cost of your uncompensated care. But I think much more importantly, this is an example of a disease for which there is a cure but only for people that have means or that have privilege. And so this, to me, is sort of fundamentally unethical. Um, and I think you could look at our current healthcare system in the United States and actually argue that huge portions of it are unaffordable for people, and that in and of itself is also uh, fundamentally um, unethical. So to me, yeah, individuals do have a, a right to health care, which of course should be affordable. So. How do I think about rights to anything in the context of our society? So um, I personally lean really heavily on a book that was written by a, an economist named Amartya Sen. And this is a book called Development as Freedom. And he basically argues that freedom is both the means and the ends to the ultimate development um, of a nation or of a society, um, insofar as you know, if you have an ideally uh, developed nation, then all of its citizens are completely free to live, to thrive, uh, to engage in markets, to, you know, to basically self-actualize. But also, removing barriers to that freedom is the process of development. And so, this is how I think about, 
you know, what our society should do for us and, you know, how we should uh, consider um, human rights. And, you know, again, if I examine citizens in the United States, you know, there's a tremendous number of people that aren't free by those definitions. So, you know, they don't have the opportunity to be free from poverty or they don't have the opportunity to seek, uh, you know, treatments for curable diseases. They don't have the opportunity to work. Um, you know, there are even groups that simply don't have the opportunity to age without fear of, you know, preventable or premature mortality. And so for these groups, you know, there's no way of getting out of this. They don't have that opportunity. Um, you know, if you're a privilege, you do, but if you're not, you don't. And so to me, our objective is to remove these barriers to freedom as a nation um, so that everybody has an equal opportunity. Um, and I think that that should really be our goal. So, you know, I consider any discussion about human rights, you know, sort of from the question of how free is an individual to reach their potential? Or do we all have an equal opportunity for self-actualization? Um, you know, and ultimately, we choose to live in community. And that means that, you know, I benefit from society, but society also benefits from me. And there's an interdependence there that I think uh, can't be overstated. And so then by extension, you know, healthcare is a cornerstone um, of development in our attempts to be free as individuals. So, you know, for so many people, the unaffordability of healthcare or the inability to access it means that they choose, and this is not much of a choice, but they choose between food and medications or doctor's visits and working or, you know, sort of waiting until your chronic conditions become so acute that you have to seek health care. That to me is not freedom at all. And so the health care that I envision that we have a right to, um, it's comprehensive. It's not a menu where there are certain things that are covered and other things that aren't and it's all completely arbitrary, um, but rather health care coverage um, includes everything that's required to allow us as individuals to thrive within society. You know, a healthy society is one that's productive. And it's mind boggling to me that it doesn't seem like we have valued health as a nation um, insofar as, as making that a priority for us to be a productive nation. So you might say, all right, this is kind of crazy. What you're proposing is gonna be excessively expensive. But let's consider the costs that we currently have. You know, I think that there are two important ones. One, there are literally thousands of people dying for lack of access to care. Um, and that's a cost that's almost unmeasurable, right? Um, but the second one is there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are, are, are effectively wasted on, you know, profits uh, supporting the private insurance industry for administrative overhead and whatnot. And, you know, to me, that's also a huge problem. And that's where we are right now. But economic analysis might also suggest and has suggested that if we were to instead um, create a national health insurance program where you know everybody instead of paying premiums just pays uh, a, you know a progressive tax first that it would be less than your premiums are now and second that we could actually all benefit from such a comprehensive system and you know at the end of the day this type of reform basically allows individuals to be free and to choose how they want to live and so as a society I think we recognize that you know, effectively functioning, it requires a basic set of services which enable us to, re to sort of realize our own potential both as individuals and in the aggregate. And, you know, a lot of that we entrust to the government, right? So we agree that roads benefit everybody, so we entrust the government to manage them. We agree that public health is good for everybody, so we enable uh, governments to support public health. We, we agree that everybody benefits from the opportunity to learn to read and write, so we create you know, government-sponsored um, public schools. And so to me, healthcare fits very squarely into these fundamental needs, fundamental rights that are necessary for our society to function. So that's how I think about healthcare as a human right. Thank you for leading us off. Um, I think we'll go right next to you to, um, Dr. Marshall Chin, who will also be speaking pro. Um, Dr. Marshall Chin, MD, MPH, is the Richard Parillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics in the Department of Medicine. He's a general internist with extensive experience improving the care of vulnerable patients with chronic disease. He has worked to advance diabetes care and outcomes on the South Side through healthcare system and community interventions. In addition to being a household name here at the U of C, 
He has led initiatives to improve health strategies at a national level as director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Finding Answers, Disparities Research for Change National Program Office, and even more recently as president of the Society of General Internal Medicine for the 2014-2015 year. Thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. So, I think that many of the themes that I'll talk about echo uh, Phil's excellent presentation. I'm going to take a slightly different tack, though, and frame my comments by drawing upon four different schools of thought from ethics. One is liberalism, which is different than liberal conservative in the political sense, but it's more of a, a classical ethical theory of liberalism. A second is redistributive justice. A third is utilitarianism. And a fourth is communitarianism. So the first is uh, liberalism. And in many ways, this reflected uh, what Phil was talking about with Amartya Sen and the idea about individual liberty, that being really a, a key priority. Individual liberty and the ability of all of us to pursue happiness and pursue meaning in our life. And it, it, a lot has to happen for us to attain that. And uh, as an example, you think about like the 1960s from your history classes and President Lyndon Johnson and the so-called Great Society programs of that time, which basically were trying to enable all elements of society, whether they're rich or poor, to attain that, that liberty and that, that meaning in life. And so there were a variety of programs. So there were a variety, for example, education programs, employment programs, anti-poverty programs, all designed to help people achieve that liberty. And then the health programs were Medicare and Medicaid. And part of the thinking was that a lofty goal like, like uh, meaning life or employment uh, or the value of work well, all that you would not get close to unless you had your basic health. It's a famous quote from Martin Luther King from 1966, where he says that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. And part of that is that unless you have that, that basic first step of, of health, well, then other things were moot. And so in some ways, it was like the cornerstone then for this first step towards liberty. So the idea about it being like a basic affordable uh, right becomes almost core then to the classical liberalism. The second theory is, uh, or, or school of thought, is re redistributive justice. And here I'll talk a little bit about the work of John Rawls, who uh, was a, a very famous ethicist uh, from Harvard for many years. And he wrote this book called The Theory of Justice. And there was a thought experiment that he opens the book with. And it's called The Original Position or The Veil of Ignorance. And the idea was that we all know that like in our society there are, are various divisions and various positions in society that, that we are part of or, or born into. So there's your race, your gender, um, your class, your income. Uh, and so there are more and less advantaged positions. And the thought experiment was, well, if before time you didn't know which position you'd be born into, what your race was, what your, your gender was, what your income was, what decisions would you make if you're trying to form a society, a just society, uh, that would be most likely to lead to the best results for all and for there to be true justice. And the belief was that if you were in that position, you would pick some type of, 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 of societal program where there would be redistribution so that uh, everyone would basically have that ability uh, to uh, attain uh, uh, their potential. And so this idea of, of then, the right then to affordable health care. Because again, if you didn't have that basic health, then, well, you wouldn't have a, a real great shot at, at, at uh, realizing your potential. The third strand is utilitarianism. And so this is sort of like uh, what Anoop comes, my guess is he'll talk a little bit about this, especially your economic way of thinking of the world of like, um, the, you want your, the benefits to, uh, to uh, you want to maximize the benefits, uh, your utilities uh, over the co uh, costs. And here the issue here is like, if you don't have health, you're not going to have a productive society. That we need to have productive workers uh, to create the goods and, and, and the, the, the benefits of society. Uh, as well as that, you, you, someone says, the old, you can pay me now or you can pay me later approach. And Phil mentioned this a little bit earlier that you can either do preventive care uh, and invest up front or else uh, treat disease complications at the end of the day, uh, which are going to be a lot costlier. And so it gets into this issue of like value-based healthcare, which is something I hope we talk more about over the course of the, the hour, 
that in some ways um, there is a solution about how you get you basically in those that happen that there's a lot of waste in, in our system. Phil mentioned administrative waste. The other waste is that a lot of care that we provide is, is unnecessary. And we don't pay uh, for, for health care based upon the value of health care. Um, it's not really an evidence-based approach. And so that there are a variety of proposals now which would basically reward and favor the uh, payment and provision of care that is truly value-based upon uh, evidence. And so that is potentially a way that we can basically improve access to more people uh, and still have like uh, the best possible out outcomes for all. The last uh, strand I'll talk about is communitarianism. Basically positive that there's a connection between you as an individual and then the wider community. You know, I think like in some ways it's an abstract discussion, but once you see a patient in the emergency department, I think that everyone's natural reaction is that like, we got to treat that patient. That and in some ways all the academic arguments against doing it just get thrown out the window because there basically is this, this, this moral sense we have of, of treating that patient. I mean, it's the idea of the Good Samaritan and that uh, we cannot fully prosper unless we all value and invest in the whole. So what do we mean by that? There are these ideas of social cohesion, collective efficacy, uh, the value of a whole uh, versus the cons of uh, isolation, division, and selfishness. So in some ways, that we're sort of seeing this in the, the current uh, presidential election, where on the whole, we have uh, one side which tends to be um, more to sort of look out for oneself in terms of uh, the, the, the presidential candidate, uh, Donald Trump, and, and then Hillary Clinton, more of this communal type of, of, of aspect. Uh, I find it fascinating following uh, David Brooks, who's the, uh, of the regular op-ed writers in the um, New York Times. He's the most conservative. Uh, and maybe in the past half year, he's written maybe three or four uh, columns, which really talk about this idea of like the communal whole and what have we lost as a society as we become more polarized. Uh, and we still see this in the media, we see that in the echo chambers that people are part of in terms of you can basically just find people that think like yourself. Um, but the idea that, like, if, again, if we are to truly sort of uh, uh, do the most we can as a society or as a nation, there has to be some sense of the communal whole. And then again, how can we not then, then provide affordable health care to everyone if we are going to have that Good Samaritan, that generosity, or not, because if we don't have that, then we do devolve into selfishness and isolation, and a lot is lost in that. All right, so we've heard from two um, pro right to health care. I think we can um, move over to Dr. Runke, um, who will be our first against speaker. So Dr. Runke, um, MD, MPH, has long been devoted to understanding our nation's health care system. While completing his medical degrees at Stanford, he earned a master's in health services research. And then after finishing his internal medicine training at MassGen, he then returned to Harvard University to complete an MPH and a fellowship in general internal medicine. In his research, Dr. Runke is interested in the relationship between health system capacity and the value of health care services. Um, at the medical school, Dr. Runke is well known for his devotion to student learning, as we just talked about, um, as the course director for um, the course on the American healthcare system. Great, Th thanks very much. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Or? Okay. Um, it's funny, Marshall, before I start, I uh, had on my list of topics to discuss the Rawls veil of ignorance, but I actually crossed it off because I wasn't quite clear what I wanted to say about it. So I, I'm definitely glad that you included it in your discussion because I think it's definitely relevant for thinking about this topic. Um, let me start by talking about the uh, distinction between rights versus privileges which there's a lot of debate in the philosophical literature about that exact distinction. So although I am against healthcare as a right, I do believe in some basic form or what is often called a decent minimum, a society such as, such as ours should provide healthcare in some basic form. Now, is that simply blood pressure and diabetes control or does it include heart transplants is another question. Um, and I think that Dr. Chin was talking about the idea that health is necessary for the productivity of human beings. And in that sense, it's often considered what's called a basic social good in the sense of education. So for example, at least getting 12 years of education and some basic level of health care is important for all people to be productive in whatever their goals are. 
So I do believe that health care should be provided in some basic form as a privilege within a, within a society such as ours. However, a right is a moral entitlement which should be established by the coercive power of the state if necessary. And health care cannot be that. And I will talk for a few minutes about why it cannot be that. Um, so th there are positive and negative rights. So negative right, for example, is your right to walk across the street without getting shot in the head and dying. There's little debate about the value of enforcing the value of negative rights. There's much more debate about what should be a positive right, which are things that you ought to receive as a member of a particular society. And this idea of basic social goods, I think, is incredibly important. We all, I think, agree that people should have an opportunity to have 12 years of education as a right. The question of how far that extends is another question. Is internet access a right? In uh, Scandinavia, they've at least tried, if not successfully, tried to make internet access a right. So does that mean that every new technology that's offered, whether it's healthcare related or not healthcare related, ought to become a positive right and must therefore be pro provided by a society and using coercive power if necessary? I just don't believe that. So, uh, so then the extending this basic social good idea. Um, healthcare is uh, unique in a number of ways, of course, from, from other goods that are produced or services that are produced by societies. But healthcare has a unique, uh, what's called inelasticity of demand, which is that um, a, a change in price produces a relatively small change in demand as opposed to, for example, televisions where a large increase in price will markedly decrease the, uh, the demand that consumers have for it. So that's, it, it's a uniqueness of healthcare, but it's not perfectly inelastic in the sense that patients do um, uh, avoid certain amounts of healthcare if uh, it becomes too expensive, and that was one important conclusion of the health insurance experiment back in the 1980s. And also, I mean, health is incredibly important, we all agree with that, but it's not the ultimate value of people. People smoke, they drink too much, they do other things, and all those behaviors reflect upon the idea that health is incredibly important, and it is a basic social good, but is it a right in the sense that it should be a, uh, a moral entitlement coerced by the state? I think not. So there, there are some other concepts that I want to talk about. One is the idea of, of trade-offs. Um, so for example, if, if, you, if you decide that you're going to provide heart transplants to patients, you're going to have to decide, is that equally important to giving vaccinations to 10 million children. And by definition, a right cannot involve trade-offs. Now, those are trade-offs within healthcare only. However, there are, there's a larger set of trade-offs. And I think it was Marshall who mentioned that we have to make decisions about healthcare budgets. And we can all talk about the efficiency of healthcare expenses, and that's worth a discussion, but not our centerpiece for today. But do you want to fix 3,000 potholes, or do you want to provide one patient with a heart transplant? Now, I ride a bike to work, so I can tell you I don't, I don't want potholes here. Uh, you know, the, the, the decisions regarding the valuation of that requires not cost-effectiveness analysis, but cost-benefit analysis, where the value of everything is translated into dollars. And those are just incredibly difficult decisions to make, 3,000 3, potholes versus a heart transplant. But the point here regarding the question of whether health healthcare is a right is that rights do not involve trade-offs, but by most definitions that I've read anyway. So there are a few other, other arguments. Um, so, uh, so defining what is a health problem is often a challenge. So is an environmental pollution and its consequences a health problem? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But that's one argument against healthcare being a right, because it's a little bit difficult to define exactly what is a health problem. Um, secondarily, there's a lot of uncertainty about the results of healthcare treatments, the goal of which is to produce health. 
Right? Now, there's no right to health because uh, there are lots of things that produce health, including medical care and social factors and patients' behavior. But there's an enormous amount of uncertainty, which has genetic factors. Um, there are behavioral factors. There's heterogeneity of effects of uh, treatment X across various patient populations. Um, so, so next is the idea of, of moral hazard. Um, that um, it's very clear that in the setting of low co-payments, uh, healthcare is overproduced. And I think Marshall said this in a sense when he said that a lot of healthcare is unnecessary. Um, if you uh, don't pay for the healthcare, then it will be um, overproduced, whereas televisions will not, because if the television is too, too expensive, you're not going to buy it. And that's another reason um, that idea of moral hazard, I think, speaks against the idea that healthcare is a right. Um, and then, how can you have a right to something that is produced by other people? So, if you say that healthcare is a right, that requires that if you need to have a fistula for dialysis, that I have to produce a vascular surgeon within some proximity to you. So how can you say that you have a right to having a vascular surgeon within 50 or 70 miles of yourself? Um, and so most rights uh, would not require the production based upon other people. Um, so next um, is the idea of changing technologies over time and geographically. So we produce the idea of a brain transplant what does that mean? Does that mean that the entire planet needs to offer a brain transplant to everybody? Certainly not. I think we wouldn't agree with that. But even within this country, the ability to access uh, various types of technologies over time and geographically is greatly variable. And that is not a characteristic of anything that's naturally been called a right. Um, so. Um, I talked about the roads and bridges. Um, and then th there's the issue of rationing. It's pretty clear that healthcare is rationed and has to be rationed. Rights can never be rationed. So we ration in this country in general in an implicit fashion rather than an explicit fashion. So there's this idea of cost effectiveness of various therapies, which we've not been very good politically at implementing in this country. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK has tried, for example, to look at what are called quality adjusted life years um, and how a particular therapy will stand up to various thresholds of quality adjusted life years or qualities. And they've, they've been somewhat successful, though not perfectly so. But the idea that he healthcare is rationed in this country implicitly in the sense that there's limited access, patients are not insured, although Obamacare arguably has uh, fixed some of that. But you can't ration rights. And that, to me, is one reason that healthcare can never be a right. Um, and then there are the challenges of how to ration. And these quality adjusted life years are challenging. Um, and what kind of health care do you want to provide to who, and what should it mean? And I'll, uh, there's a story which I thought of this afternoon. When I was taking a health economics course as a medical student, uh, we were talking about these qualities. And, and there was a guy in the room who was sitting in a wheelchair. And we decided that um, health care had to value the ability to ambulate. And he raised his hand. And he said, do you mean to say that my life is less valuable than everybody else in this room? And the professor didn't know what to say. Because the answer is yes, you are less valuable than everybody else in this room. The, the sort of flip side and the policy perspective, from a, a, an individual doctor patient interaction perspective, I think it doesn't matter. Because you do everything for the patient that you can. But from a policy perspective, it's important <laughs> Because if you don't value the ability to ambulate, then you cannot pay for anything that prevents challenges in ambulation. 
So it's a, it, it, it's a challenging question to answer. And, and in my mind, the necessity of rationing and the method with which rationing occurs across various countries is a very strong argument against healthcare itself being a right. Um, so I guess that's. Thank you, Dr. Renke. We'll move over to our last um, pro right to healthcare speaker, Dr. Wong. MD, MPH, he's an Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of the Center for Translational and Policy Research of Chronic Diseases, and Associate Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research here at the U of C. As a general internist, he studies clinical and healthcare policy issues at the intersection of diabetes, aging, and health economics. His main focus is within medical decision making for elderly patients with type 2 diabetes, in which uncertainty exists regarding how to best individualize treatments based on clinical parameters and patient preferences. He's also co-principal investigator of the NIH-sponsored Diabetes and Aging Study. Um, from 2010 to 2011, he served as a senior advisor in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Department of Health and Human Services. He received his bachelor's MD and MPH from Harvard University. I'm impressed by how eloquent the prior speakers have been, and I, I, I will not be as eloquent. Um, I have a very, I, I approach this with a very, um, some of the themes that have been brought up already, I'll, I will um, readdress. Um, but the way I approach this was uh, potentially legalistic, which may be um, helpful uh, as we move on to a new. So I, you know, the question is, what defines a human right? And does health care meet that definition? And I think Greg has, um, done a good job of sort of going through that, addressing that question, and um, I'll try to counter that and explain why I do believe that health care, affordable health care is a human right and meets the definition. Um, so a human right is supposed to be uh, an inalienable right you are entitled to for simply being born a human being. You're born and it is a right that you have uh, upon your arrival. It's inherent to all human beings. It's supposed to be applicable everywhere and at, in every time. It is universal. Um, and it has this added layer, which is it's a protected legal right, uh, which uh, uh, Greg alluded to, which is that it's something that the state is involved with in some way. Um, and let me give you another, uh, uh, this may be helpful also, which is to go through examples of other established human rights. Uh, and, th and these are from um, the United Nations. So one has the right to life, freedom from torture, freedom from slavery, right to f uh, a fair trial, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and freedom of movement. So think about does affordable health care uh, fit uh, among, those, uh, among those rights? And I'll talk, um, uh, I'll get to eventually the idea of negative and positive rights, but also the evolution of rights over time. Um, and it is clear that affordable health care is not a right that uh, in 17th or 18th century America people were imagining as they wrote um, uh, the Constitution. Um, but I think I'm going to try to explain how I believe um, as health care has evolved, as our understanding of biology has evolved, that it makes some sense to think of affordable health care as a next generation right. Um, so I'll just go through a few bullet points of ideas why I think affordable health care meets the definition of a human right. So all humans experience illness. So it's a universal experience. All humans experience illness in, in their life. And illness causes suffering. Um, and the idea of health care is that health care alleviates that suffering. So for a basic universal experience like illness and suffering, therefore I think it's reasonable to say that affordable health care, which alleviates that suffering, could be argued as a right. Um, a second point is that, um, actually, that uh, was alluded, was actually well supported earlier, which is that health care, access to health care, facilitates other human rights. And in particular, I started off with that litany of rights, the right to life. And I think you can't achieve the right to life without access to health care and um, martial and Phil have um, both um, talked about that eloquently. And um, 
and they and everyone's talked about the right to sort of maximize your quality of life or you maximize your potential in life. And you can't really do that in this day and age without access to health care. Um, one thing that actually wasn't really explicitly mentioned as a third bullet point is if access to health care is not a right, the problem with not making it a right is that it perpetuates health disparities and economic disparities. So if we were to allow health care to not be a right, then um, um, ethnic and racial minorities who are already disadvantaged in some way or socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged people, if there is no involvement of the state in providing access to affordable health care, then we perpetuate disparities in health outcomes um, across groups. And, and that, um, to me, uh, argues that health care should be a way. Um, so, I'm going to talk about negative rights and, and positive rights in some more detail. So uh, the, ne the original first generation rights were clearly negative rights. And the idea is that, um, uh, is that we, sh we should be free of oppression from the government. And so if you notice, m many of the rights, freedom of speech, uh, uh, freedom from torture, slavery, we are, we are not meant to be oppressed. Uh, we are born into the world, and we are not to be oppressed by the government. Um, and and that, that's the origin of those negative rights. Um, and healthcare is clearly not um, one of those uh, negative rights. And actually, opponents of healthcare as being a, a human right say that it actually leads to a, a, another form of oppression, which is that um, basically, if we mandate the state to be involved in healthcare, we are taxing people to provide that healthcare. And um, so, those um, opposed to healthcare as a right argue that that's a form of oppression. Uh, so ta you know, taxing, raising money to provide these services, which, is, uh, which we can talk in more detail about, um, is a form of oppression. But um, I'm going to counter that um, that doesn't quite make sense to me uh, because of other uh, empiric, uh, you know, I'm going to give you some examples of things that we uh, pay for through taxes, through taxing people. That, are, that we all assume as basic human services um, because we are trying to maximize our right to life. So I'll give you some examples of things that we readily pay for without question. We pay taxes for police. We pay taxes for fire, the fire department. We pay taxes for our military. Um, now those are more immediate um, uh, protections to our right to life. Police protect us from getting shot, hopefully. Uh, the fire department puts out fires that can threaten our life. The military protects us against invasion from other nations. Um, in the case of health care, I would argue that it's in the same vein, that we are uh, you know, paying taxes for access to services um, um, that extend life, improve quality of life. And so it's reasonable in, in, to think about in the same way as, as, a, um, um, as, a, a serv as something that government provides and um, if we already accept those things as things that we tax and, and uh, we raise taxes to pay for, why not do the same for health care, um, which is um, integral to the right to life? Um, so uh, to talk, uh, lastly, I want to talk about um, sort of evolution of rights over time. Um, in 18th century America, maybe these things weren't thought about. Um, you know, health care was, you know, was not in our Bill of Rights. Um, but that's okay. Um, things change over time. And think about how much knowledge uh, about the human body, disease, and treatment has evolved over time. Things today that we accept as completely, uh, that we expect in our, in our everyday quality of life, people wouldn't have known about in 18th century America. So uh, great examples are, um, should we expect our water to be free of lead? Um, I, 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 th I have little kids, and I, I don't want them to be exposed to lead uh, you know, and, and incur brain injury. Um, lead in the water can only be addressed through uh, a public action and through the role of government. Um, another example is we now know so much about the, the role of um, uh, clean air or air pollution in the uh, development of lung disease and other, other ailments. How do we get about? How do how do we uh, produce clean air? That requires concerted action on the part of a state state actor. I can't. It's unlikely to occur in a purely free market environment. Um, so I think um, 
So what I'm trying to say is that um, our knowledge about human biology, disease, uh, treatments has evolved over time um, such that um, the things that we expect in everyday life, in our right to life, uh, requires the involvement of affordable health care. Um, I'll end by saying that I think where we could probably agree is that, uh, where I will agree with my, um, with the con uh, part of the table, is that um, what actually is affordable health care is very debatable. And this gets into um, um, both the definition of what defines affordable, what defines health care, um, and um, is plastic surgery health care? Um, is uh, dentistry part of health care? Um, and, and, and you know, we can go on and on about you know, what actually represents affordable health care. And, and I think that's actually where the true debate probably is. I don't think anyone in this country believes that no one should have access to basic emergency care, but the question is what level of care, health care um, is going to be affordable and a, and a right. Thank you. We'll move on to our final speaker. Dr. Milani will be speaking against. Uh, Dr. Milani, JD, PhD, is uh, the Lee and Brenna Freeman Professor at the University of Chicago Law School, and he's also a professor here at the Pritzker School of Medicine. He's also a university scholar at Resources for the Future in Washington, which is a research, um, he's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in Boston, a senior fellow at the Schaefer Center at the University of Southern California, um, an editor at the Journal of Law and Economics and on the board of the University of Chicago Press. He has a PhD in economics and a JD, both from the University of Chicago. He has clerked for Judge Stephen Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals for District um, for D.C. and Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor on the U.S. Supreme Court. He conducts research in law, economics, and health economics. His health economics research focus, uh, focuses on the value of medical innovation and insurance control of infectious diseases, and placebo effects. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, begin with uh, two things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work through some, some thoughts uh, about the right to health care. So the first thing I want to say is, is state my general conclusion, which is uh, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, people do deserve a basic level of access to health, uh, or, and we as a society should try to provide that. Uh, but I don't like talking about health care as a right. Uh, I think health care is a right, or the idea of a, a right to health care is a rhetorical tool used to basically argue for this general idea that we should provide some health care. Uh, it's not really well thought out. Uh, I think it's unhelpful because it, it, it often allows us to avoid detail, uh, details about how we're supposed to to, to pr provide that basic uh, uh, service. So, so, so with that, uh, uh, basically the idea that, that, that healthcare is a right, that's my, uh, is a rhetorical device uh, and, and not helpful beyond that. Let me go into to kind of a, 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 a framework about thinking about this. So, so let me tell you the premise that I start from. So I, I am, uh, I'm a welfareist. I believe that, you know, I'm roughly utilitarian uh, in the sense that I believe that people's utilities should be weighted equally. Uh, people's, uh, may, people may have different preferences. Some people will take more risk, some people less risk. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, we ought to try to maximize that. We ought to try to make everybody better and everybody counts the same. Uh, I also believe that, that, that there could be a more just distribution of not health, not consumption, but utility. Uh, I believe that everybody that, that, that there should be more of that. Now, what it is exactly, I, I don't I don't know, but I'm roughly a welfareist. Okay, so that's where I come from. Um, uh, but I don't believe that there there that we ought to talk about a right to health care, and I don't think it's going to get us very far. It might make us actually take us further away from from a society that we'd like. Um, so first of all, I want to be deal with some semantics. Some people confuse a right to health and right to health care. Those are two distinct things. We cannot we cannot provide a right to health. Uh, unless we have a solution to the flu or to the common cold or to, to, to you know, aging, there's no right to health. Uh, there's only a right to health care. Okay, so let's talk about a right to health care. Well, it's important to remember that health care is not health for reasons that, that Greg's identified. You know, um, it's not obvious that health care always provides health. There's flat of the curve medicine, there's wasteful expenditures. 
It's also the case that it's not obvious that people always want health. We're always willing to make sacrifices for health uh, to get other things. Like you crossed the street to come here, you took a risk of dying uh, from a traffic accident, but you thought that being here and listening to us was worth it. Uh, you know, some of you probably go skiing. Uh, some of you travel on planes. Some of you drive cars for vacation. Those are all compromises that you make. So it's not obvious to me. And if we look at poor people uh, and we see what they consume I mean, in, in, in lower income countries, they consciously make uh, decisions uh, sacrificing what we think are commonsensical things like food and health in order to have things that we think are frivolous like entertainment. Um, and I can tell you about uh, you know, I recently I had a visit to slums in India, and what was amazing to me is that more common than toilets were satellite dishes on slums. Um, so that, that, that tells me that people are willing to make that sacrifice even when they have low income and, and they're willing to spend on other things. Um, also, you know, there's versions of, the, of today's talk that was supposed to be about the right to health, right to health care, right to affordable health care. I have no idea how you make right to health care affordable um, for reasons uh, that Albert talked about, but also, you know, somebody has to pay. Uh, either, either physicians have to pay by sacrificing their wages and provide it and being around to provide it. Uh, the government has to do it, in which case taxpayers have to do it, or we have to issue debt. There's always going to be a cost, so we need to think about that cost side. Um, so we need to think about, when we talk about affordability, we're really talking about, uh, we're really talking about cost and who's going to bear that cost, and, and we need to think about that. Okay, but let's suppose that we want to talk about a right to health care anyway, or affordable health care anyway. We have to ask ourselves, who's going to provide that right? Um, okay, presumably it's the government, because we think it's unreasonable to say that you know, physicians owe us the right to, to owe us non-physicians the right to, to health care, right? That that's a, a kind of sounds like a little bit of a slavery or forced uh, charitable actions, which we're uncomfortable with for other reasons. Um, but okay, so we're talking about the government. H how are they supposed to do that? Um, if we establish a right to health care, does that mean the, the government? What does that mean? The government have to do, has to do? Does it mean is that just a proxy for single payer? Uh, is it a proxy for Medicaid? Is it a proxy for the NHS, like in the UK? Um, or can we do kind of more relaxed things? Like, uh, what if we just did something like EMTALA? Or premium subsidies, would that satisfy the right to health care? Um, okay, uh, what, what about just uh, providing some, some basic uh, uh, income and saying you could spend that on, on health care? Um, so we need to ask exactly what it means to satisfy the right to health care. Um, and then you also have to ask like boring questions that us lawyers really care about, like who? Which government? State? Federal? Municipal? All of them, uh, you know, a right means nothing without a remit, without some obligation somebody has. Like, so Albert can't kill me. There's no right to life. Like, by the way, there is no right to life in the United States. There's a right in tort, in criminal law and in tort law to not be killed by another human being. That's not the same as right to life, okay? So I have a right, and if Albert does something to me, then I can go to the state and cause him to either stop or make him pay damages if I'm already dead. That's what the right is. Yeah, but but uh, but the thing is, we need to ask ourselves um, in in the right to healthcare, who do we sue and how does it get paid? Uh, that's an important thing. That uh, there needs to be a remedy. Uh, who who who's held responsible? Also, you have to ask who enforces this. Um, is it just like a general thing that we want to have as a rhetorical device, or does it really mean that you can petition Congress? Most likely, when we think about rights, you go to courts. You have to decide which court to go to. But you go to a court. You go to a court and you say. This government, the city of Chicago, did not provide me health care, or the federal government did not provide me health care, and the, the city of government, or, or the, the state court, or the federal court has to decide, okay, they didn't, they either have to, or they have to pay you damages. By the way, something like this exists in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, employee benefits under RISA law, uh, and it's really a conundrum because if you sue the government, and so, so in, in the context of RISA, there's an employer benefit plan, you can sue the employer benefit plan that might provide health care for not giving you access to certain health care. So people then sue, but then who has to pay? The employer benefit plan, right? The problem with that is that that means that other patients are paying because there's a fixed budget uh, that goes into the employer benefit plan. Okay, so let me give you another example. And you think, okay, well, that, surely that's not going to happen at a, at, a, at a large level. We'd probably avoid that. Let me give you the example of Brazil. So a few weeks ago, I was in Brazil. I run this program called the International Innovation Corps, and we were invited down to Brazil. There's our team in the back row. Uh, um, we were invited down to Brazil because the Brazilian government had this problem. So the Brazilian government provides public insurance, but it also has a right to health care. It actually has a right to health care. And, and if you're an individual, a Brazilian citizen, and you want to get some treatment that's not covered by the government, there is a good government health care program. But if, you don't, if, that, if your treatment is not covered, 
I'll give you an example that was given to me. Somebody wanted a hip replacement with, replacement with an experimental therapy that was happening. There was, there was part of an experiment or trial taking place in Italy. The person wanted that. So they go to court and they say, I have a right to health care. The court says, OK, you have a right to health care. Now government, Ministry of Health specifically, you have to pay to fly this guy to Italy to participate in this trial. And the government says, but wait a second, we'd love to spend this on vaccines and other things. And the court says, right to health care. 4% of Brazilians, of Brazil's health budget is spent on these injunctions. They spend $2.5 billion a year, which is a large amount for Brazil, on these injunctions. They have 80 of these injunctions issued against the government every day. And, and the Ministry of Health was trying to figure out, like, how can we help them convince the Ministry of Justice that they should at least do cost effectiveness analysis? And they said, but it's really hard to get these guys to agree, the judges to agree to do cost effectiveness analysis. So again, we've got to ask like, exactly how are you going to administer this? Now, you've got to also think about this. You know, I, I feel like I'm carrying on the legacy of, of Richard Epstein, both in terms of, of the position I take and talking beyond my time. Um, <laughs> but you have to ask yourself, um, what, are the, what are the alternatives? Okay, so let's suppose you didn't have the right to, to health care uh, from the government. You know, what other mechanism could you use to provide this? And, and so somebody like Richard Epstein would have said the market. And people say, oh, no, the markets are terrible. Markets don't provide health care. Um, but we want to ask ourselves, what exactly makes the market bad? And is the right the solution to that problem? I, th I think some people think uh, that markets, they, they give examples of situations where the, 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 where, the, where the market is bad. Prices are so high for stuff in the United States. But the pro-market guys say, well, the reason why this happens sometimes is not because of the markets, but because the government interferes with markets. Uh, for example, you know, if the government didn't subsidize health insurance, prices of health care wouldn't be as high. It's, it, lots of things where you're not subsidizing uh, insurance for something, prices are low. Look at electronics. Prices fall over time, even though quality is improving. That doesn't happen in health care. Prices keep rising. It's not clear that quality is always improving to keep pace. Um, and maybe this, so it's the government's provision or, or, or subsidization of insurance that's the problem. Sometimes people say the market is bad because of bad distribution. Right? Rich people get whatever they want. They get quality health care, but poor people can't get quality health care. But the answer to that is not to eliminate the market. The answer to that is, is more moderate programs like premium subsidies for the poor, means-tested uh, means premium subsidies. Give poor people access to the money that they could use to buy insurance that would cover this sort of thing. It's not to have the government provide this uh, completely necessary, uh, necessarily. And also, you've got to ask yourself, in much of what we consume, markets operate. And we're happy, right? We like our phones. I do. I use it for my notes. Uh, we like our schools. We like our cars. We like lots of things that we consume. In fact, we rarely consume health care if we just look at total, total, uh, total expenditure by the average person. Um, and for everything else, we have markets, and we love it. Why is it that we suddenly don't like it uh, and think that we need to be a right for health care? That, that's not obvious to me. Um, also, you, know, you might want to ask, like, are, are, if we have a right to health care and we say the government has to do it, are governments really that great? I mean, look who's running for president. It's not obvious that this is great. Look at, look at other places where the government gets involved in health care. The market for organs, or the allocation of organs, there are huge queues for kidneys. We're not super excited about that. Look at Medicare's incapacity to do serious cost effectiveness. That's a problem as well. So it's not obvious that the government's always great in health care. Um, and you also have to think about, look, I'm one of these like, small, you know, uh, Main Street versus Wall Street guys. I think there's a lot of crony capitalism in the world. If you said that there was a right to health care and you asked me who would benefit, I would say insurance companies and uh, big hospital chains. Those are the organizations that would say, hey, great, now you have to buy my services and I can jack up the prices and you're going to have to do it because the courts are going to make you. So who's benefiting there? It's not obvious to me. I'd, I'd rather figure out a way that we can benefit patients without having to indirectly benefit large corporations. And the last thing, I want to say something that's even more provocative and mean. I apologize for this, but this, this is, I, I, I try, I do this every time, and, and Mark knows this. I ask, let me ask you a question. Let's, let's suppose you want to have a debate about isolationism, foreign policy, okay? Whether we should be isolationist, turn in words. Would you go to a conference of defense contractors and have that discussion and expect like kind of a level-headed debate? Okay, well, let's talk about the right to counsel, like the right to legal counsel in civil trials. And you said, OK, let's have that debate. Should we have, and by the way, it is an active question whether or not I have a right to counsel, typically in criminal trials, but we could ask that for civil trials. Do you think you'd want to go to a law school and have that debate? What do you think you would expect as the answer? OK. Where are we? <laughs> I want to think about that, right? You know, let's at least get some more taxpayers that are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, doctors in the room. I I'd love to see that. 
and, and then have the debate so that we can see the people that have to pay for it uh, also talk about it. Okay, I'll stop. 20 minutes over time. Thank you. We've heard from each of our speakers, so I've seen you guys writing notes um, on what other panelists have said. So I think at this point, um, we can open it up for you guys to either respond to um, something you heard another person say or ask a question to another panelist. Um, basically, debate amongst yourselves at this point. <laughs> I, I, I'm probably just going to destroy all that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I knew if I cannot, uh, I, your praise of the market is, uh, I, I think in some ways, uh, it's bewildering. Um, there's so many examples where the marketplace is not working for healthcare. Um, and you argued that it's, it's the government's fault because of its uh, involvement. And I think um, just to provide an example of how that's just not, it's just not it, it can't be entirely just the government's involvement. Um, is let's just take the example of uh, EpiPens or uh, the drug prices. Um, that is functioning like a normal market. In many of these cases, there's only one manufacturer of a product because it's difficult to do. Um, insulin is another area where there's only three or four manufacturers of a very, a very essential product, um, and firms um, behave as they should. They raise prices to, to maximize profits. Um, and that incurs a lot of harm um, in, in, in public life. So, that I, 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 in, in insurance markets, I, I, you know, we have a lot of examples where the, um, you know, the idea of the, the various state marketplaces um, created by the Affordable Care Act was that these, there would be competition among insurers, there would be you know, some fighting for, for uh, new customers, and that has just totally failed, especially in rural areas where there aren't enough insurers. So I, I don't, just based on these facts, I don't know how non-involvement, I, I don't see how the marketplace is working. Um, uh, I don't know the right solution either, but um, uh, lastly, uh, this idea of the premium sub subsidy, um, just giving people cash to solve healthcare, the act, you know, to provide healthcare access is in some cases, ludicrous. Um, and the reason is that, um, uh, is, is, is about location <coughs> and geography. It takes a lot to build a hospital. It takes a lot to build a trauma center, to have surgical suites, to provide the infrastructure for some forms of healthcare. Some forms of healthcare are easier to provide without that infrastructure. And, um, and, I, and without a, uh, a, some government involvement in shifting the allocation of where that happens. Um, I, and we do that in a variety of different ways, uh, historically through disproportionate share hospital uh, payments, uh, through the creation of federally qualified health centers. Um, you know, the, the South Side of Chicago would not be the way it is without government involvement in supporting a lot of the uh, activities of healthcare in, in poor neighborhoods. So I uh, uh, would love to hear how premium support alone could address just the, the location of people and where they need services and the difficulty of building up health services um, uh, to address their needs. I was just going to say that like in some ways there's probably more agreement than disagreement about the basic question about do people have, uh, uh, should people have access to s some level of, of, of uh, uh, reasonable health care. Um, there may be slight differences in terms of you know, where that, that we are in the spectrum of like uh, what's sort of like the, the an adequate level of health care, but probably more agreement than, than not. And I think as Anoop said that in some ways the, 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 the key question then is well, how do you get to like uh, the, the best possible health care system? What, what, what combination of some ways of free market and regulatory approaches will get there? At the same time though that, that the process of change does become is, is a combination of both a, a scientific process because there is evidence regarding things like the effect of insurance coverage on on and use of, of healthcare, or uh, there is an evidence base in terms of uh, the value of certain types of healthcare. But the whole implementation process do, does ultimately come down to a matter of a prioritization values and will. And so, in some ways, the, the basic question we're talking about of like the, the sort of in some ways the moral question. Um, ultimately does become very important. So, I mean, University of Chicago being an example. 
at times we varied in terms of how, how uh, what our priority it was to serve our, our surrounding community. And part of the differences over time have been differences in the values of leadership, differences in the value of the institution. So it matters then values. So it is really this combination of, 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 of some ways evidence, but leadership and values. And so both are be to be used and, and valued. Um, I guess what we're discussing is the right to affordable health care, and I see that as a right to access to health care, um, and maybe not viewing that as a positive right, but rather, you know, what you were talking about with negative versus positive rights, but rather as a negative right, um, and that being the right to not be discriminated against. And we live in a society where health care is a privilege that is provided, and so perhaps health care is not a right, but if we are all in a society where that is a privilege, then that privilege should not be denied to you based on the neighborhood you were born in or the wealth that your family might have. I was wondering what you what your thoughts on that might be. Well, the, so the, the idea here is that uh, you have a negative right to not be discriminated against. Uh, right. That's your, your question. Uh, well, I have to say I've never thought about that. It's an interesting idea and a relevant uh, concept. Um, but I think that um, the, the practicalities that we talked about, the technological changes in medicine, the geographic availability of certain technologies, um, is a far more important practical consideration than that. Although philosophically, I absolutely understand your point. Um, have you thought about this? Yeah, I actually have another article uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. So for healthcare, there wouldn't be a driver for a hospital to go out to the suburbs, right? Because instead of having a tremendous amount of uncompensated or Medicaid patients around here, they wouldn't lose money by being a hospital in the suburbs. I don't think we need I, I, well, let's just, uh, so I of course agree with you that healthcare ought not to be a right. Um, I do agree with Elbert's perspective on the market solutions. There are lots of ways in which healthcare is unique. Patients are not able to evaluate the, the value of a CT scan when they have a headache, whereas you're able to judge the value of a television and is it worth three or four hundred dollars to you. So I think the market solution idea does not make sense. But what really rang true to me with what Anu said is that rights are not a solution to these problems. Rights, Elbert talked about the, the right to police or something. So I have a right to police, but it took me 47 minutes to show up to my house, and the burglar had 30 minutes to steal everything in my house. So I lost my rights, but what does it matter that I have, by definition, a right to a police person being there within five or 10 minutes? Rights are not solutions. They're not a solution to the lead problem. The city of Chicago tells me that to solve my lead problem, I need to pay for a replacement of pipes, even though it's my right. So I think rights are not a solution. I think markets are not a solution. I think market, that rights are not a solution either. Uh, all I can, I, I can certainly say that I, I think a move is, like, you know, laid out pretty strong position that healthcare isn't a human right. Um, it's, it's obviously, uh, you know, not this is a, I don't think this, this is a, probably a third generation right discussion. Um, the, 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 you know, the United Nations, the, w, the World Health Organization, these are healthcare organizations, of course, several, se several body, governmental bodies have said that access to, to healthcare is a human right. Um, obviously, others still debate whether or not it is. So I don't know if it's, a, I don't, I, I think that this is, a, I think there's debates over the definitions, there's debates over whether or not it makes a difference or not in terms of real action for for uh, for people, but um, there are institutions that have said uh, healthcare is a access to healthcare is a good one. And I think that I think it, in 500 years it'll be a completely different discussion. You know, I suspect that that rights are right for our time, and and I think I think you see this clash a little bit when you know people make their stand on the Second Amendment. You know. What what was what do you do you go with what the the writers of the Constitution intended or do we interpret it for our times now? And I think that those are probably very different notions. And so I think it's probably a pretty malleable notion, and you sort of have to you have to go with whatever your personal philosophy uh, you know allows you to think, and also what society accepts 
you know, my personal philosophy is, you know, a lot different, you know, is reflected in the fact that I'm a single payer supporter, but I have this sort of personal crazy notion that we're all evolving as a humanity, and I'm not going to see the fruits of that in my lifetime, but I like to think that, that as, a, as a species we evolve and that, you know, that evolution is a, is a sort of a community based approach to things, you know, but this is just my personal ideas. It, it has nothing to do with what, 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 what I think are sort of rights imposed by the government or, or by the state. Now, I, I actually believe that, you know, that healthcare as a human right is one that should be assured by the state, but um, although I have to say that arguments against are fairly compelling, but, you know, <laughs> but, but that's more from a practical versus a personal philosophical standpoint. And, you know, this is my personal belief, and I'm going to work for that. Um, but I get, you know, I get the arguments against the practical. The, the thing that everybody keeps saying to me when I talk about being a single pair is, is this whole nonsense notion of don't let, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I, I don't like that, because to me, that's like saying it's okay that 30,000 people die each year uh, for lack of health insurance. So I can't, you know, to me, the good is not good enough, and I need the perfect, because otherwise I, I can't sleep at night. So, you know, that's, that's sort of my personal philosophy, but I, I think it's a good point. And I think our relationship as individuals to rights from the state, that's going to that's gonna be a pretty pretty fluid thing over time. So, like, uh, Jim or Mark, you asked, well, what would I be thinking if I were one of the students and walking out of the room and thinking about what does this mean for me? I think in some ways, like, I wouldn't get too caught up about specific words and, and uh, some of the intellectual arguments about the specific words. In some ways, I think you might think about integrating three of the courses, I think on the first year courses you're taking, there's uh, the course you've already taken. How many people are first years? Probably most people. Yeah. Well, there are three courses that uh, some of us need to be, if already you're thinking about how to integrate these different ideas. So one is the course that uh, Mark leads that starts in the uh, winter. And it's, 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 it's your basic ethics course, which has predominantly sort of an individual perspective. So you're learning about like the, the perspective of your individual patient. How do you respect their, their, their autonomy, and how do you sort of look out for their, their welfare, for example, that type of thing. There's Greg's course, which, what is that given in the spring there? I uh, know it's in right two, two or three weeks. Oh, no, yeah, no. But so the health organization course. Greg's second year? It's a first year. First year, yeah. yeah. Which is the healthcare system course, where you learn about some of the policy things we've been talking about, about them, like the design of the healthcare system, and the big three of access to care, and quality of care, and cost of care, and, some some issues probably have to do with them, the mix of, of free market and uh, government approaches. The third is the first course you took, which is the course that uh, Monica Bella and uh, um, Val Presley on disparities and advocacy, which starts to get some in a global sense of like the, the <coughs> uh, your sense of values regarding inequity, but also the advocacy component. And in some ways, that's the subtext for this whole discussion that you need to think about well what. What, what is your role in advocacy? Uh, and and that, that one of the things that course was a spectrum of advocacy, ranging from probably everyone agrees that you need to advocate for your, your patient. Uh, but <coughs> hopefully, um, uh, many or, or most of you also see that there's a role for advocating for improving the system so that you know, whether it's the local system, like the here in Chicago, or the state or national systems, so that we maximize the, the, the outcomes of, of all our patients. And so, this idea about the of of rest is a general term that it just sort of obscures in some ways these more specific things that you define the <coughs> individual, the system, and then where you see yourself in terms of your roles and advocate for locations in, in the population. A lot of people that, that compare us to Canada because it's easy. And I and I, I mean I think I, I agree that, that there's a lot of problems with that comparison. Although they are geographically spread out pretty well, there are an order of magnitude fewer people there. Uh, and there are a lot of other things that are different about the way things run in Canada. So I think cross-country comparisons can be kind of difficult. I do think, though, that we have the opportunity to compare, um, at least at some level, private insurance versus Medicare in the United States because we have Medicare as a single payer. Granted, a hugely flawed single payer, right? I mean, Medicare only covers about, on average, 51% of the cost. Traditional Medicare, without any of the additional uh, Supplemental plans only covers about 51% of the cost that uh, that you know senior citizens bear, but it is a single payer system that operates you know efficiently and effectively 
um, both for practitioners and for patients, at least by many measures. And so some people will turn to that as a comparison to try and you know extrapolate from that experience to well if we just expand this to everybody you know let's make a bunch of assumptions but you know it's predicated on making a, a tremendous number of assumptions some of which may not be valid. A few questions about both cost and, and quality. So as Eller said that no question that the per capita cost of the U.S. is like force meant to be a liar across the, the world. Quality is yes, an issue like the, the word quality. And there are different definitions of quality, but probably one of the most uh, popular ones or most commonly used one is the one from the Institute of Medicine. We sort of break quality down to like about a half dozen different domains. And so where we get killed in terms of what, what probably causes like a lot of the 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 the, the, the poor statistics is what the group said. Uh, this this contract of equity is more, more equitable in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the the quality of care that we provide to uh, uh, vulnerable populations. Um, access is the other one too, that if you don't have access to the system, then you're going to have uh, the, the worst outcomes. Those are probably two of the big, big drivers. The other four though too, I mean, we actually don't do quite well on uh, in this country either. patient centeredness I mean, the systems set, aren't set up to be patient-centered. Um, safe, well, you've heard all the different uh, statistics about uh, all the medical errors and how the systems are designed to be safe. Um, effective care, well, you know, a lot of the care that's provided is necessary effective care. And I think the statistic was something like, like a lot of the evidence based guidelines, uh, overall, the country may be about half of uh, what would be in that in terms of care provided to patients. Uh, the timeliness, uh, same thing, that you know, you've been in the labor in terms of how things take, 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 take place. So there's a lot of work for everyone. Probably the big drivers in terms of like the course cases that are that, um, the access issue, the equity issue. I, I would say one, just one thing, I hope the great comes, but part of it is. Uh, there's some classic uh, ideas about why we are expensive. One is technological innovation and, um, uh, and um, so patient expectations. Patient expectations are high in the United States. They like a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> Non-transparency of costs. So you know, costs are because we have insurance. No one sees the cost. It's, it, it, it's hard to it's hard to bring that down. But I think there's a structure. We have this historical structural problem. Actually, introduced by a government program. We guaranteed health insurance for people 65 and older since the mid 60s through the creation of Medicare. There's no other segment of the population that's had, except for, I guess, the, I guess the over time, the poor, the very poor of Medicaid. And so we had this weird system where you guarantee health insurance when you're, when you're the most expensive, uh, the most, most, most likely to use health <coughs> in, in the later part of life. Um, and we, we have not, and so if you know anything about the natural history of diseases and when they happen, we can insure people at the wrong time of life um, and provide prevention at the wrong time. It's kind of, so it's a backward system. And so uh, I agree with Nip also. If I had an organ disease, the United States is the place to be. If I have bad cancer, the United States is the place to be. Um, I think we don't do as well on systematic provision of preventive care, secondary prevention. Uh, and we do badly usually in these international comparisons. But if you got end stage cancer, <laughs> great. I hope in your course, starting a couple of weeks, you'll also talk about maternal mortality. Maternal mortality between 1990 and 2013 has declined in the entire developed world. The, the numbers have gone up. Those mothers are dying. The, the U.S. is the only developed nation in the world where maternal mortality is gone from 12 per 100,000 to 28 in that 23 year period. It's the only developed country in which the numbers increase. And while you're at it, I know Greg is going to talk to you about Chickasaw County, Mississippi, where maternal mortality is not 12 or 28 per 100,000, but 595 per 100,000. And is 25 times higher than the average bad maternal mortality rate in the United States. Those, those are numbers, I mean, when you ask why we're the most expensive and why the quality is not as high as it ought to be, a lot of the long with mortality and end of life uh, longevity. Um, to take a look at those numbers. They're really disturbing numbers. And if we understood those, we understood Chickasaw County, Mississippi, 595 to 100,000, understood the whole United States, 28, much higher than any developed country in the world. 
And it's going up, not down, the way the rest of the world is doing. We, we know a lot about the American healthcare system and, and what, we, what our problems are, what we have to do. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming.